Hi everyone, welcome back. In this video, I will discuss briefly about battery applications. Um, since we've just covered electrochem in great detail, we learned how to balance uh, these redox reactions in acidic and basic solution. We learned to calculate cell potentials um, and design voltaic cells. We also learned how the relationship between electrochem and thermodynamics and equilibria all play a role with one another, which was quite fascinating. Um, and so I wanted to give you some real world applications. Now, this is just a brief summary of a few batteries that are out there. Batteries um, are something that is a huge research field. And I know that some of the students taking my course desire to become electrical engineers or environmental engineers where they want to work towards cleaner energy resources. So once again, by no means is this an extensive or exhaustive list. This is just common examples you know, given in a general chemistry course. Um, and if you wanted to go on to study this further, or take a course on batteries, then hopefully this knowledge um, will cause you to reflect on what you've learned in my class. Like that's just my hope. Um, and if you watched my introduction to electrochemistry video, which I posted on Canvas rather than YouTube, um, you would notice that there's other applications of redox reactions, such as cellular respiration. So if many of you are going into biology, then you'll definitely see redox there. Um, organic chemistry, we talk a lot about oxidation reduction reactions. Um, and so right now I'm just focusing primarily on batteries because that was the focus in our textbook that we're currently using. But like I said, I am by no means a battery <laughs> specialist. That's not what I studied in graduate school. Um, but like I said, I just wanted to go over some of these examples with you. So thank you for watching. Um, the first one that you commonly use in your household, the so dry cell batteries, uh, maybe more specifically the alkaline batteries. I know I use these quite a lot with my little kids um, toys, <clears throat> but basically in a common dry cell battery, the zinc case acts as the anode. And then there's this graph graphite rod immersed in a moist and slightly acidic paste of manganese four oxide and ammonium chloride. So that acts as the cathode. So it looks like we're in slightly acidic solution here and it produces about 1.5 volts. <clears throat> now alkaline batteries, as you see here, if it says alkaline, I want you to think basic. So these batteries are occurring, like these redox reactions are in basic solutions. They still have a similar design where they have the graphite rod, which is the cathode, but it's immersed in a paste of manganese uh, four oxide and potassium hydroxide. So rather being in that weak acid of ammonium chloride, it's actually in a strong base, so making it alkaline. Um, and these are longer working life, and you can see how the zinc, when we're undergoing oxidations under basic solution there. And so these reactions are a little bit more complicated. You're working with species that you haven't seen before in my class, since this is general chemistry and not advanced inorganic chemistry, but you can kind of appreciate where the electrons are being lost and where they're being gained. And just looking at the designs, very unique, very different than what we studied, right? With the two beakers and creating a voltaic cell, right? <clears throat> but all the principles are the same. Um, and so, another common battery you come across in everyday life is your car battery, right? And these are lead acid storage batteries. And they consist of six cells wired in a series. So you can kind of see the series here. <laughs> Each cell contains a porous lead anode. That's where the oxidation occurs. And a lead oxide cathode. That's where the reduction occurs. And they both are immersed in sulfuric acid, which we all know, and that's a strong acid. And so this is occurring 
under strongly acidic conditions rather than the basic conditions that we just saw in the alkaline dry cell battery. So if the battery, and this is, I know this happened to me, especially I think one time in graduate school, I had left the car light on and therefore my battery ran out, right? And if it's ran for too long without recharging, too much of the lead to sulfate builds up on the surface of the electrodes, so this stuff here, and the battery dies. It can't function anymore, but it can be recharged by an electric current. So at the very end of this video, we'll talk a little bit about electrolytic cells, and you can make a non-spontaneous cell, electrolytic cell go forward, but you got to supply some sort of external source. So in our cars, we have alternators that helps to reverse the reaction. However, sometimes that's not strong enough to reverse it. Maybe you have jumper cables and you use someone else's car to give you enough juice to <laughs> reverse the reaction. And then there comes a time when you're like, no, the, the battery's just dead. I gotta buy a new one, right? So <clears throat> now with all these tablets and smartphones and laptops that we have in our homes now, there are other rechargeable batteries. Batteries that, um, you know, for these super high drain devices need to, you know, operate for long periods of time without um, needing a charge, um, need to focus on, well, one of the primary goals um, for battery research is making sure the device doesn't get overheated, right? Um, and so all these things we have to take into account when designing batteries, especially as technology um, is improving drastically, right? So one of these batteries you may have heard of is nickel cadmium battery. And that is a rechargeable battery used for portable computers, your drills, camcorders, and other small battery operated devices. It does use cadmium, which is oxidized under basic solution here, and then a nickel species, which is reduced. <clears throat> now, these are not very environmentally friendly, and so there are other choices um, for these very similar type of nickel battery, and that is to use a nickel metal hydride battery this is also used for digital cameras, high drain devices, and it's very advantageous for high current drain applications due to the lower internal resistance. And what we see here, if you see M, that just stands for metal, and H kind of, you know, next to the metal stands for hydride. Hydride is a hydrogen with two electrons and a negative one formal charge. So when it's with, for example, sodium, sodium's plus one, then you have sodium hydride. So different than a proton, which is H plus. And so you can see for this nickel metal hydride battery that it occurs in basic solution, but you're still using the nickel species for the reduction. This is more environmentally friendly than um, the nickel cadmium batteries, and it's a common choice for hybrid cars. And like once again, obviously researching um, better batteries um, for electric cars is a hot field right now, right? So like I said, if some of you are interested in doing this type of research, there's so much more that needs to be done. Another type of battery is a lithium ion battery. And so this one's very interesting. It looks a little different than what we've done before, um, this is the, the advantage of these type of batteries is that they're lightweight and very high density. That's really important when you're driving a car, right? Um, it's also the most expensive. It's used in Teslas, so that might explain a lot. Um, and then the operation is primarily due to the motion of lithium ions from anode to cathode. So once again, you have a graphite rod, it's an anode, and then you have a lithium transition metal oxide, which is acting as your cathode, and there's a spontaneous flow of electrons, of lithium, actually no, I you know, apologize, of the lithium ions from the graphite anode to the lithium transition metal oxide cathode, 
and also corresponding electrons um, from anode to cathode as well. So pretty fascinating, a little bit different um, than what we've seen before when we're writing out our redox reactions, right? And then finally, another type of energy source um, you may have heard of is fuel cells and using those to drive our cars, having fuel cell cars. Now, the, the thing with fuel cells is that the reactants need to be replenished from an external source. So for example, if I'm driving a hydrogen fuel cell car, I would need to keep adding more hydrogen in there, but these are definitely environmentally friendly. If we look here, the oxidation of hydrogen gas to form water and then the reduction of oxygen gas um, here. And in the end, if we were to add these up, we end up with this overall reaction of hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas gives us water, right? If our only byproduct <laughs> when we're driving our car is water, then we're doing pretty good. <laughs> that is, that's a big goal, right? <clears throat> All right, so like I said at the beginning of this video, you don't need to memorize this. This is only for your personal enrichment into understanding how a knowledge of redox reactions and their chemistry is so useful and actually so important for real life applications. And I know some of you are trying to think about what you want to do, you know, like what career do you want to go in? And if this sparks an interest in your heart, it's like a passion, then do some more reading, you know, ask some more questions about what's out there. What's more current than what I've just taught you, you know, because there's always research being published, especially um, in these energy fields. And like I said, I run into students all the time where they're like, I really want to make a change and I really want to make this earth a better place <laughs> and focus on environmental applications. And we need people like that out there. So I just wanted to, to share this with you to inspire you and, and also to make electrochem a little bit more relevant in your everyday life. Now, if you're taking my class in electrochemistry, we focus mainly on voltaic cells, which are spontaneous, and that would be what you're tested on um, in the final assessment. However, I did want to go over electrolysis briefly, just so you know the difference between the two, so that you know the difference between a voltaic cell and electrolytic cell, so you should know that. So a voltaic cell remembers something that is spontaneous. An electrolytic cell is non-spontaneous. And so you need to supply some sort of electric current. So to tie it into what we just talked about, if let's say we wanted to have hydrogen fuel cell cars, remember with fuel cells, you need to replenish the reactants. And so the reactants are hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, right? But those are not readily, well, oxygen gas is readily available, but hydrogen gas less so, right? And so one way to do that, to get hydrogen gas for our fuel cells is to decompose water. So if we took water, and we were to break it down, we would get hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Well, unfortunately, this is non-spontaneous. I don't know if I should say unfortunately. It's probably really good for us <laughs> for other reasons. But um, in this case here, it's non-spontaneous. Um, and so therefore, we would need to supply an external source to kind of make it go forward. So you can see here, you can imagine that if you have water um, with a soluble salt in there, remember like a salt bridge, um, and then you have this attached to electrodes with an external source, you could 
um, decompose water to produce and capture the hydrogen gas and the oxygen gas to use for whatever applications, like a fuel cell car. And so I was thinking, well, like, you know, if you're just using electricity, then that's not very environmentally friendly. Um, you know, what could you do to make this a little bit cleaner? And you could imagine maybe creating and, you know, and, and they, people are doing this, by the way, this is not an original idea, <laughs> but just like thinking about using the sun's energy, right, um, to do this electrolysis. So it's solar powered. So rather than using electricity, which we're mainly using, you know, coal and, and things like that, and it has a lot of harmful byproducts, using solar power as a cleaner energy source that we could tap into to do the electrolysis, to produce the hydrogen, to use in our fuel cell cars that gives only water as a byproduct and doesn't contribute to the global warming that we're finding ourselves in today. So just some kind of ideas to get your, to get you thinking um, in terms of applications. And like I said, um, maybe this, you know, piques an interest in you. So thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time.